Before I start, I would say that this is one of the most boring presentations you guys will see on your lives. Because we are touching the part where the real time makes difference, difference and where we need some math background. And this math is boring by its nature. But we are, I'm trying to find a way to explain things in a more, I'd say, reasonable way. And I hope I, I can do it. So mind the gap between real time and theory. I'm Daniel. I work for Red Hat in the real time team on the Clark's gang. But I am also a PhD student at the Scuola Superiore Santana in Pisa, Italy, and the Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina in Brazil. So I live between the war of uh, practical real-time and theoretical real-time. But let's start explaining the, the things. Let's say that at the beginning, the computers have the software and the logical sequence that it needs to follow. And uh, the correctness of the software was about uh, the correctness of the logical sequence of things. But then someone said, OK, we cannot wait forever. We have uh, to finish this uh, before a deadline. And then we have the theory of the real-time systems in which the correctness of the system does not depend only in the logical correctness of the software, but also in the timing behavior of the system, in the response time of a real-time task. So <clears throat> this. We have, a, okay, in one side, like on my Red Hat side, I'm a, a dev kernel developer and I deal with code and tasks and the scheduler and Linux problems. But on the other side, in the theory, they don't have this kind of abstraction and they don't work on the operating system kernel level of abstraction. They work in the math domain where things are defined as variables like uh, the system is not composed of a process. The system is composed of tasks, and each task doesn't have a, actually a code. It has some timing properties. For example, a, a system is composed of a set of, uh, of tasks. Each task is composed of a set of uh, timing characteristics, like a task has a period, like we have in SCAD deadline, we have to set, a worst case execution time, uh, and one time that it blocks on some uh, shared resources like a mutex or spin locks on our domain, but on their domain it's just a variable saying, okay, I can block this amount of time. And we can have some kind of jitter. And using just the variables, abstracting the code, they try to define or develop a scheduler in such a way that for all tasks, the deadline of tasks is shorter or earlier than the deadline of the task. So, for example, in the real-time uh, theory, a very well-known uh, scheduler is the fixed priority scheduler, which is somehow similar to the FIFO scheduler, and we have a, a task with a priority. And for this kind of scheduler, they have a, one formula that says that the worst case response time of my task is the busy window of the task plus the release jitter of the task. And uh, the busy window is composed of the execution time of the task plus the blocking time in which it's blocked waiting for a resource plus the execution time or the interference of tasks of higher priority. And uh, they get a set of tasks and do discount and say that, okay, if for all tasks in my task set, if for all the tasks, the response time is before the deadline, I say that the system is schedulable and I can provide guarantee using this scheduler. And so they think on this level. Uh, another, there are some simpler models like the, for the scheduled deadline, the, okay, step back. When they develop a scheduler, they try to make such a formula to guarantee this. That, that's their goal. For example, on the SCAD deadline, we have that formula is simplified. 
or for an EDF scheduler, and they say that the utilization of the system should be lower than 100%. That is, the runtime over the period of the task, the sum, if it's lower than uh, one or 100% of time, the system is schedulable, and they prove these guarantees using math theorem and lambs and so on. So, okay. The development of a real-time scheduler, in theory, it's not done in the basis of a code reasoning, but on math reasoning. For example, this is how it looks like a, the implementation of a scheduler, which is, we will talk a little bit about this in, a, in the other presentation. And you see here, we don't see code. We see just graphs and the formulas. Formulas, formulas, formulas. So, but generally, when they develop such schedulers, they reduce the complexity of the system and assume things that Things like, uh, okay, the system is fully preemptive. Okay, the tasks are completely independent. All the operations are atomic, like the arrival of a task and the scheduling of the task takes atomically in the same moment. And there is no overhead of uh, operations, for example. And, well, these operations doesn't exactly fit on the systems that we have. For example, on Linux, even on the preemptive RT, the operating system is not fully preemptive because we can disable preemption. The tasks are not complete independent because when in scheduling, we have locks protecting the scheduler. So one text, task can influence in the operation of others. Operations are not atomic because when one task is awakened, we need to in queue it in the scheduler, we need to check if we need to reschedule, and we need to decide to call the scheduler, call the scheduler, call the context switch. So we tend to say that that reality is not our reality. And that's a war between practice and the theory. And we have like uh, articles from Thomas Glexner, for example, criticizing this. And okay, uh, that's, this is not, that is not our reality. Okay, that we cannot say, we cannot beat on them saying that these are not uh, realistic because there are very simple operating systems in which those things are real, but they are mostly very simple system where the scheduling is done offline or beforehand, they know the number of tasks. So the problem is not that they don't use realistic assumptions. The problem is that our reality is not that reality. But what is your reality? What are our constraints? Okay, so as I was saying, okay, our system is not fully preemptive because we can disable preemption. Tasks are not completely independent because we have spin locks protecting the scheduler and so the scheduling is ne not, neither atomic and not independent. And we have overhead. We are, we are in a more complex environment. Okay, and so we can tell them, yeah, boys, uh, our reality is not that. You guys are wrong. And say that, okay, uh, the math side, okay, my math side talking to my developer side. My math side would say, okay, developer, talk is cheap. And then my dev side, okay, hey, math side, the code is a, a computer, it's math. You know, the code is there. You can just read the code and understand stuff, right? And then my math side would say, okay, talk is cheap, show me the math behind this story. Like, it's easy to tell, okay, read the code. But generally, the guys that are developing a scheduler in the academic side, they are not Linux kernel developers. They are PhD students, like in the, between 20 and 30 years old. We know that takes a lot of time to understand Linux kernel and how things works. So we need to show the math behind Linux kernel to them so them can use and they can base their development in the math that we have in kernel. So 
inside our mind, the mind of a real-time developer, we know that uh, we, have, uh, we can disable preemption, and disable preemption we can cause latency. We know that we have uh, different kinds of locks. We know the difference between a mutex and, and uh, a spin lock. We know we have interrupts, and we try to explain this like many times. But when we try to explain things using natural language, like I'm doing now, things are ambiguous. For example, is preemption disabled bad or good for latency? We tend to say it's bad. But actually, when we are scheduling, we are with preemption disabled. And if we have the arrival of a task right before the scheduler, we will have the best case latency. So just explaining things on language give us this ambigu ambiguity that turns things confused for a mathematician, right? So we need, okay, I think we need to, rather than explain a explicit model that we have inside our, implicit model that we have inside our mind, write a explicit model explaining all this behavior in not using a f natural language, but using a formal method, a mathematical language. We also need to abstract the code, like rather than explaining all the code we have, explain things that can cause, in, that can interfere in the response time of a task, but without showing code. Working on their domain, not on our domain. But we need to do this without losing contact uh, with what we have in practice. We need to explain kernel using a mathematical language, a mathematical model, but without losing contact with the way that we understand the kernel. So how do we observe the parameter T? Which kind of things we use? We mostly use trace. We get a latency, we trace the system, we see the events, the chain of events, and try to explain things. Okay, this latency was caused because I had a series of uh, interrupts. Or this case where this latency was caused because I have this new code that disabled preemption for a long time. Or, and so on. So inside our mind, we think on trace, events, and the states in which we cause latency, for example. And uh, this, this set of uh, events, trace, and states is in common with the theory of discrete event systems. And discrete event systems, they also have this idea of events that cause a state change, and we form trace of events. And so, in some, my thesis of my PhD is that it's possible to explain Linux using discrete event systems uh, theory. So why not try to describe uh, Linux using this formal method? Yeah. Why not? We know Linux runs inside our mind. We know how the dynamic works. Why not try to explain? So in the discrete event systems, it's from control theory. Uh, we have some methods to explain systems, like uh, Petri networks. Who here studied Petri networks in the academic side? Okay, good. And automata? Yeah, that's formal methods. It's, it's a very boring class when you are in the undergrad because it catch us. It's hard to define a system and get in all the possible states and prove it's working. And that's the idea behind of discrete event systems. So formally, in, in among these methods like Petri networks, stochastic systems, and automata, we have automata, which uh, it, it was the, the language I could express me better. The Daniel developer could express his model inside his mind using the mathematical ma model. So one automata is a set of uh, states, 
a finite set of events, a set of functions that say, okay, if I am on this state and I receive this event, I'm going to this state. For example, I'm running with preemption uh, enabled. So I'm in the preemption enabled state. The event of disabling preemption bring me to the state in which I'm with preemption disabled. I will return to the initial state if I receive a preemption enabled. So I have one initial state of the system and a set of final states of the system. And then we say that when we have a trace, a set of events that is recognized by this automata and is generated by this automata, we have uh, the language that this system is, uh, speaks. So we want to, using this method, speak the language that the kernel speaks. Like on these terms of disable preemption, neighbor preemption, call the scheduler, and so on. Okay, this seems to be very hard at doing these things in, in the sets and uh, functions. Yeah, it, it's hard, but Automata has a graphical format that turns all these things easier. In the graph format, we have an initial state, and then one event causes state transitions, like the, from the state X, event G, I'm go to state Z. And this is a final state. So this graph format helps me or helps the developer to explain things on a graph format, which is way more intuitive. I know it's boring, but it's more intuitive than working with sets and regular expressions. And this helped to, in the development. So, then one might think that I would have to, the, to explain all the Linux stuff using drawing this, drawing this uh, automata. And we can think that, okay, the number of states on Linux is way higher than three, right? And it would be very hard to draw a, even one system, draw an automata, a specified automata of a system like Linux that, for example, in the end we will see that for the single core we have more than 10,000 states. It would be, it's not possible by a human to draw off the states. It's, it's the boring of the boring. So. But there is one modeling approach from the theoretical uh, control engineering in which we design the system using models, small pieces of the model, a modular approach. And I'll explain uh, a little bit in the single core what I did before, but in general case, what we do. We construct models of the generators of events independently. For example, I can disable preemption and enable preemption. I can disable RQ and enable RQ. I can call the scheduler and return the scheduler. Each one of these is one model. And then we assemble all this model using a mathematical operation of automata. And we have all the possible chains of events, those that are possible and that are not possible. Then we design the control rules that say what is possible or not possible using also automata but using specifications. And then when we assemble everything, we have a complete model of the system using the formal language. Okay, it will be easier explaining things step by step. So, example of models. We can have a task. Initially, a task is sleepable. And when we have like scared waking, it, it becomes runnable. And then when we return, for example, to sleepable state, set, in set current state to interruptible or uninterruptible, the task becomes sleepable again. Okay, but waking up the task and turn this sleepable uh, doesn't actually put the task in the scheduler or make it run or re remove it from the scheduler. One task starts running after we do the context switch for it, uh, the context switch, like from task one to task B, and it starts running. Then it runs, and uh, if, uh, if the task, for example, suspends its execution or is prompted by a higher priority task, it will suffer the context switch back, re returning from the running. So the task is not running, context switch in, it's running, context switch out, it's not running back again. We can call the we can have a thread running. We can call the scheduler, 
and return from the scheduler. We can also set the need resched, which is itself just a, a model as, as simple as this. We can, like, in the initial state, we say that the system is with a preemption enabled. Then we can call, we can disable preemption to delay the scheduler and enable it back, or we can disable preemption to call the scheduler because the main scheduler function, the dash dash schedule, is always called with uh, preemption disabled. And then after running the scheduler, we can enable it back again. We can disable interrupt and enable local interrupt. Before handling one IRQ, the processor itself mask interrupts and then deal with uh, handle the IRQ and then in the return it uh, enables back the interrupt. Yeah, I told this is boring. But that's how things are. And uh, that's the complexity of Linux. And that's the complexity we have inside our minds. And we so far had not found a way to explain for mathematicians. But here we are talking like uh, using terms that we know, enable preemption, disable preemption, call the scheduler, return from the scheduler. It's our language as well. But I'm expressing these using a mathematical language. And that's the gap between the reality and the theoretical real time for Linux. So there I was explaining the events independently. And that's all the, and when I synchronize all these automatas, I have a huge automata with all possible chain of events. I'm not forgetting any ch chain that could happen. But this, this chain of events might not happen in the reality because one event blocks the other. For example, okay, the need resched and the sched waking events, like set need resched, sched wake up of a task, they cannot take place uh, with uh, preemption and IRQs enabled. So how do I model this? How do I express this in an unambiguous way using automata? I say that in my initial state, we are with preemption enabled on the preemption RT. And then we can have either preemption or interrupt uh, disabled. And then when we disable the other, we can have buff disabled. And only in this situation, we set need resched and call sched waking. So in the mathematical terms, we say that the having preemption and IRQs disabled are sufficient conditions to wake up a task. And those theoretical guys understand that. Okay, one might say that, okay, I can disable preemption here with a preemptive disable, like here, the, the events are on the top of the edge. Like preemptive disable would cause me this, and preemptive, preemptive disable to call a schedule would also bring me here. So, okay, I can skip the local RQ disable. So, oh, no, that's just a part of the model. We have a lot of these small rules of sufficiency and necessary conditions for the occurrence of the events. And uh, for example, I cannot call preemptive disable and then disable preemption to call the scheduler because the model here blocks it. They are mutual exclusive. In this state, I cannot call this, okay, the preemptive disable is sched is present on this state, but it's not present on this. So it cannot happen here. That's why this guarantees me that here I would have to take either preemptive disable and RQ disable or RQ disable and preemptive disable to cause the, the conditions. Um, this scheduler is only called with preemption disabled to call the scheduler. The scheduler call never takes place with IRQs disabled. The context switch always takes place after entering in the scheduler, but before returning for the scheduler. So the context switch always takes place with uh, 
preempt it is able to call the scheduler and local IRQ disable, or local IRQ disable and preempt it is able to call the scheduler. These are sufficient conditions to call the context switch. And okay, there I was talking about, can you guys read this? No, yes and no, okay, so I will switch here. Okay, now easier, right? There I was talking about sufficient condition. A sufficient condition says that something can or cannot happen, but if it's possible, it can. A necessary condition, it says that, okay, if we have all the sufficient conditions and the necessary condition, the, ne the, the thing will happen for sure. So here is the need risk add uh, uh, model, that the models, the necessary conditions for the need risk add to call the scheduler to context switch. So when I have in the initial state, we have all the, con uh, like I can take mutex, I can take a read and write uh, semaphore, read and write uh, locks, and I can do all the events of the system, right? But if at any time I have a need risk head, I enter in this model that will only brings me to the initial state after a context switch. It means that Okay, I have the context, I have the need reschedule who takes place inside the scheduler right before context switch. The context switch will be already uh, ready to be done. All the sufficient conditions for the schedule switch will be present and the necessary condition takes place. So I have the context switch. This is the case in which the need reschedule takes place with preemption disabled and uh, local RQ disabled inside the scheduler and so I'll be ready to schedule, I'll be, I will schedule. Okay, this is, is, this is one very specific case. But generally, uh, this will not take place. That's not the, the common path. So, as I said before, the need reschedule only takes place with preemption and IRQ is disabled. So, I will only arrive in this state with both preemption and IRQ is disabled. I can enable, I can enable preemption, and then I will have a preemption enable. But I can disable it back and ping pong here. I can enable IRQ and disable it. And while, for example, if I am with local IRQ disabled because of the wake up, not because I'm on IRQ, then I enable IRQs back. In this case, I can disable IRQ again because of the occurrence of a, a interrupt and I can ping pong here. So, but as the system uh, makes progress, we might enable, like, uh, enable IRQ, then enable preemption, and when this, and when we have, like, enable preemption and enable uh, IRQ, I will reach to the state in which I will for sure call the scheduler because that's the only allowed operation. And when I, okay, or I will either disable preemption to call the scheduler if I am not calling the scheduler, or I will call the scheduler if I am already in this very part in which I, for example, I, my thread is running. It's about to call the scheduler. It disables preemption to call the scheduler. I have an interrupt that wakes up a task. I, I don't need to, disable and enable uh, preemption again because I'm already on the way to call the scheduler. So I don't have much time to, <laughs> to show all the cases here, but this automata shows that someday, sometime in the future, I will arrive to this condition in which the only thing I can do is to cause the contact switch and then return back. Okay, this automaton explain part of the latency in the terms that, okay, when I have to wake up until the, the sketch switch of the task, this is the main part of the latency that we study. But I'm explaining this not using 
the terms that you use in the scheduler, but using a language, uh, a formal language. And this is the model that explains the latency. We're using their terms. And so here they can extract the information like, what, what is, how, how is the latency composed? The latency is composed of the time I spend until enable, en enable preemption and uh, IRQs, and then the time to call the scheduler, like enable IRQs, enable preemption, I disable the preemption to call the scheduler, call the scheduler, and return to the initial state. And I am in the method explaining that I am not missing any any event. Um, so, by synchronizing all these models, I have a model of how Linux works using automata. For the single core case, the model is composed of 12 generators and 33 specifications or control rules. I have, uh, I explain things using just 34 events, which is a limited amount of events. And the, the system has a little bit more than 10,000 states. And uh, I will ask uh, Paul McCain's help here because I would say that, okay, it seems that 10,000 states is a huge state space. But do you think it's huge, Paul McCain? Well, it depends on whether I'm doing it by hand or not. I mean, <laughs> if I was talking to the, to the academics, I'd tell them that uh, their stuff is an assembly language and they need to compile the Linux kernel to it. And no problem then. Yes. <laughs> in the other presentation, he said that he has a case in which he, I think it's with RCU that, or memory model, which there are millions of states. Uh, there, this was a little bit different. It was a uh, SAT formula, but it okay. had 90 million variables and 200 million clauses. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do that by hand, just in case you're curious. <laughs> so, 10,000 states is a reasonably low number of states. And, okay. And the benefits, okay, let me see the next slide. Okay, but nice, but what do we, okay, nice, you explain things, congratulations, but how can we use this in practice? So, from the academic side, understanding the kernel dynamics using their language will allow a PhD student that has just three years to finish the PhD to understand the kernel dynamics without reading the code and that's good because generally, the guy that does this kind of stuff is a brilliant mathematician and a brilliant mathematician. Like, it's hard to have one guy which is a brilliant mathematician and a kernel developer at the same time because these are two very complicated stuff. And we are generally thinking of person with 25 years so, for example, this, this uh, paper here was, was written by a, a colleague, mine and uh, Alessio colleague, which is Daniel Casini. He's a brilliant mathematician, but he would not have time to learn the kernel and do this stuff during his PhD. Even though he, he, for, he, I'm sure he can, but he will not have enough time. So, the first drawback that the first output is that we can explain the kernel dynamics using more mathematical ways for the math mathematicians to understand the kernel without on, without reading the code, which is not on their domain. And we can start developing new theoretical system. A new we can develop a new theoretical model that fits on Linux. And we can rework already the developed algorithms to actually fit in the restrictions that we have on Linux. And so we avoid problems in which, okay, I, in the scheduler, I didn't consider that I task can suspend. And then I implement the scheduler ignoring this. And then we end up finding problems as we end up finding already. So from the development side, from our side, the thing that matters here, what, what can we do? Okay, the first thing that we can have is that, okay, we have a model that explains the kernel 
as it should work. But it can be the case that because of a bug, the curve is not behaving as we modeled. At the first, during the development of the model, the problems were generally in the model. The model was not representing the kernel. But as I, I made progress, we end up finding cases in which the kernel was not being as efficient as it could be because the model told that we have an inefficiency. For example, this, this suggestion of patch, which is part of the RT, I catch one case while developing the model, I catch one case in the preemptive RT in which the scheduler was being called in vain. So we were missing a little bit, it was like two microseconds, three microseconds, it's very small, but if we think on the theoretical side, it could say that the worst case scheduling overhead of Linux was two times the scheduling overhead. It's not a beautiful statement. But still, we can use this to, to catch bugs on the prem 30 when we, do, when we misbehave in the code. And that's something we will discuss in the microconference uh, in this afternoon. But we can also set a new uh, we can also do a new set of metrics for the parameter T. Because when we deal with latency, we are actually analyzing the delays between these events, seeing the kernel as a black, a black, black box. We're not observing these events. And there's a very low probability of catching all the worst cases inside a execution. For example, what is the worst case is scheduling overhead? Will the worst case scheduling overhead takes place with the worst case scheduled disable latency? It will probably not. Will this happen at the same time in which we have the worst case uh, interference from interrupts in the latency? Probably not. So we have, we, by analyzing piece by piece and assembling piece by piece, getting the worst case, we might find that there is the possibility of having a higher latency that we we'll probably hardly catch with, with uh, the cyclic test, for example. Another point is that to use uh, theoretical worst case execution time uh, methods, probabilistic methods like uh, extreme value analysis, we have been doing research, okay, extreme value analysis is a way to probabilistically define the worst case execution time of a task. To be able to use it, we try to, to use it on the latency and it's not possible because it doesn't fit on the needs of the method because it's vary on very different ways because it depends on very different variables. IRQ overhead, scheduling overhead, preemption disable overhead. So we could not use that method. But if we analyze metric by metric, we end up having more consistent uh, variables data and we can start to use these probabilistic methods. For example, to define worst case execution time of tasks or worst case execution time of interrupts or worst case execution time of the section that disables preemption. And then we can analyze the kernel piece by piece. And, uh, let's see. Where is it? Here it is. And uh, at the real time microconference, uh, Julia Lawal also said that, Julia, Julia is Italian, okay. Julia said that we can also use those rules to make static code analysis in the kernel to catch problems by the code and not by the execution of the system. So the model ha brings us uh, new opportunities to improve the practical side as well. And uh, okay, uh, we will discuss this idea of new metrics and uh, how we can use this to catch uh, problems on the parameter T on the real-time microconference that we have this afternoon. And I'm sorry, I know it's boring, but someone needs to done this work. <laughs> and so, questions? Questions? I throw it, but my aim's not quite that good. I'll throw it from here. What's the, the cost, if there is a cost on maintaining such a complex model when the kernel should change or to verify that? Good. No, that, that's a good question. Okay. I'm dealing in terms of the preemption model. 
And the prime priority model is there for a decade, more than a decade now, right? And these kind of events didn't change in this last decade. Um, this model is still for single core. It will change a little bit for multi-core, but these restrictions for multi-core, like enabling uh, spin locks, they are there for a long time and they have more or less the same behavior in, in the terms I use here, like disabling, disabling preemption. You disable preemption before blocking. So this thing, it's on the kernel for more than a decade. The SMEP is there for more than a decade. So this, the, the level of abstraction I'm using is on kernel for more or less a decade and will change when we change the model. When we will change the model again, um, quantum computers, I don't know. You're trying to say that we need a dash stable model? Sorry? We need a dash stable series for the model as well as for the kernel? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this, this, these things, <laughs> this change, let's say, this change take place uh, almost every many years. No, that's a good question. More questions? So you have the, is it working? Yeah. Uh, so you have the bridge to uh, move from the kernel side to the okay. theoretical side, and I was and everything is performed by hand. I was wondering if from one direction you can have some tool for automa uh, automatic model generation from code, and the other way around, like uh, okay. automatic code generation from the model. Okay. Like to to have a. Okay, the idea is, okay, can I, having the code, generate a model automatically? It's hard because the code always developed forward. It doesn't go backward. So I can extract a DAG from the kernel, but it's very hard to transform a DAG back in an automata. But inside the automata, I have all the infinite possible DAGs in a finite state space. So from the automata, I can, from the model, I can have all the DAGs, but from the DAGs, I cannot have all the model. I'm not sure if I have all the model. So the kernel can generate a DAG of events, but I will hardly have get back a automata. Because the automata is, a, is supersedes the and then you have uh, the model, and then we will go back to the situation. Yeah, you need to analyze the code, and then you will try to transform the DAG into a automata back, and that's more or less what I end up doing. Like, we analyze the kernel going forward, and then we try to make it go back to make the model. But yeah, that's it. We can have a DAG, all DAGs, all infinite DAGs, all the infinity of DAGs inside the automata. So I can explain all the infinity, state, all infinity chain of events in a finite state space, and that's a nice mathematical property. And my math professor will be proud of me now. Good? Okay. So um, what have you done uh, like in various states? And cool. Can you hear me? Uh, now okay. yes. All right, now you can, great. Okay. So um, I understand you, you analyze the kernel space, but what about the driver space, like all the, you know? The yeah. Good, good question. So I'm analyzing the kernel core things. How about the drivers? Does drivers change this, this model? They are supposed not to change, and if they change, they are breaking the preemptivity model. So in the driver, we can disable preemption, we can enable preemption, we can uh, disable interrupts and enable interrupts. So I'm using here the vocabulary of things that driver developer also use. Proof that this is more or less correct is that when we move from the non-preemptive model, which is the regular kernel, to the preemptive model, which is the preemptive kernel, we don't need to adapt drivers, mostly. So the preempt, yeah, we might need to rework it to have a shorter preemption, but still, we are still using the same vocabulary. So, I'm, in, I'm including the things that the that driver needs, and uh, yeah, and the driver needs to follow the, the kernel. And it already follows because that's how Prem30 works.
Hold, 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 hold the box. No, hold the box. It's a microphone. It's a microphone. Oh. <laughs> okay. So some, sometimes when we're doing this timing analysis, like you, you may have a lock or a mutex or, or something in between, and it is kind of very hard to bound like how much. Good that, question. That okay. Time is taken. So how, how does this uh, model? Okay. So when we have that's, that also applies for the execution time of tasks. Like, okay, I have the blocking of a task in a mutex. It's very hard to define how long will the task be blocked on that mutex, right? That's the idea. Okay, I am not here expressing the timing behavior of the states. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to simulate the system and say that I can block this for this long. And I'm not trying to define the, the time in here. What I'm trying to say are how one event influences on the task timeline. I can have a task trying to catch the real-time mutex. Inside the real-time mutex, I will have, if it's not, uh, if it's already taken, I will have to take the, the, the spin lock that we have inside it, and then after uh, added me in the wait, in the queue of uh, tasks waiting, I will run the code for the priority inheritance, I will call the scheduler, and I will go out, for example. I'm modeling in this state, but I'm not trying to say how long you will stay on this. So my model doesn't, doesn't actually work to simulate the system and to define, but it defines all the states, and we can observe these and then use other analysis to make the, the analysis of the blocking time. This will clarify. Yeah, but I'm not, but I'm not telling how bounded it is. However, I, I'm, I'm sorry. We should probably stop at this point and let Yuri have his have his time. It's a good question. Maybe that needs to be talked about. Yeah, Maybe at the but yeah, that, that's okay. That's thank it. Thank you all now. very much. Well, thank the speaker.